Hey everyone, welcome to Church Online. My name is Bowen, and I'm so excited that you decided to join us for church today. We are really excited about the service that we have for you today, and the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to spend some time in worship. So come and join us as we do that.
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. So it's announcement time. 
The first thing we want to let you know about is the Power of Prayer Night, which is coming up this week, Wednesday, March 24th. Uh, but actually, I'm going to pass it over to Amanda, and she's going to give you all the information that you're going to need. Here you go. Hi Pathway, I'm Amanda and I am part of the prayer team. I would like to invite you to our Power of Prayer Night on March 24th at 7.30 p.m. It will be a night where we get to connect with the heart of the Father through prayer and um, just giving Him our personal prayer requests along with praying for our community and the world around us. And so I hope you can join us on March 24th at 7.30 p.m. I look forward to seeing you there. In-person services are back up and running. For those who are loving the online life and are staying here, fantastic, we're not going anywhere. But those who would like to join us for an in-person service, we have two going on right now, one at 11 a.m. on Sundays and another one at 6 p.m. on Sundays. If you'd like to join one of those, all you need to do is go to the Church Center app and sign up or visit the website, go to the Sunday tab and again, click sign up. Here at Pathway, giving is an integral act of worship that expresses our gratitude, faith, love for others, and our alignment with God's mission. Generosity flows from a belief that all we have, are, or ever will be is not ours to hold on to, it's ours to share, because God has shared His wealth with us and we seek to bring glory to God. If you'd like to give to Pathway Community Church this morning, here are the ways that you can do so. You can make an online payment, set up automatic withdrawals, send an e-transfer, or pay with PayPal. For more information and assistance, please visit us at pathwaycc.net slash give. Hey Pathway, and welcome to church. It's so exciting to have you here as we continue on in our famous Last Words series as we lead up to one of the most important parts of our Christian faith in the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. We want to be sure we talk about the resurrection a lot. So guys, as we open today, today we're going to be talking about Jesus on the cross with one of the thieves and the conversation that took place between the two of them and really the transformation that happened with a man that was dying on a cross in the last moments of his life. But before we get there, we're going to read our passage. So we're going to turn to Luke chapter 23, and we're going to be reading in verses 39 through 43. Again, that's Luke chapter 23, verses 39 to 43. Read with me. So it says, Then one of the criminals who were hanged uh, blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answered, re answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that you give us so much hope in this life. And today, as we seek to glean what we can from this passage, Lord, I pray that your words would be speaking to us. Lord, that you would touch our hearts and that you would help us to see you in a whole new light, that we would be able to be changed by your words. And Lord, that you would just show us how amazing you are and how much your grace extends to the farthest reaches of this earth. Lord, we love you. We pray that you would be here with us in your name. Amen. So here we have the idea of the crucifixion. So it's not even an idea, the story of the crucifixion. So Jesus is on a cross with two other criminals hanging beside him. Now, crucifixion is something that's definitely, we don't really acknowledge it as far as our modern day culture, except for in a church religious setting. But crucifixion was not something abnormal to the people in Jerusalem uh, during Jesus's time, or even the people in the rest of the world, as far as the Roman world goes. There would have been hundreds of crucifixions per month, if not more, that would have happened right on the doorstep of these people's uh, lives. Um, it was the Romans' favorite way to, to execute someone. It was their favorite way to punish someone or put someone to death because of a few different reasons. It took a long time for a person to die. It was demeaning for that person, and we're going to talk about that. It also was extremely painful and maximized the transgressor's suffering. But most importantly, there was no hope for someone who was condemned to be crucified. It was they were going to die, 
and it was going to be rough. It was going to be painful. And the Romans knew this. And not only that, it lengthened as much of that punishment time as humanly possible. Uh, there was no exception for Jesus. There was no exception for the criminals that were hanging on the crosses next to him. They knew that they were condemned to death. There was no getting out of it. There was no appeals court. This was happening. Uh, but what we're going to see here is when we have the heart to believe and follow Jesus, that can change our ending. It may not change our circumstance, but it can change our ending. And we're going to talk about that. But there's basically three processes that happens that we see in this short little passage. And the first one that we're going to talk about is the ridicule that Jesus went through. Look, everything about crucifixion was designed to humiliate the convict as much as possible while they slowly died. This was, again, I'm not going to get into the details because we don't have a ton of time. I enjoy studying about the crucifixion details, but the, the, the idea was it was as much pain as possible for as long as possible so that the person who was being punished could have as much potential to be punished for as long as possible. Um, we, we talked about it before where it was not uncommon for a crucifixion to last 12, 13, 14 hours. Um, even longer. Some, some records even say three days is how long people could hang on these crosses. And the Romans would actually take bets and, and cast lots to see how, uh, how long a person would last on a cross before they actually died. With this kind of attitude, as calloused as it seems, you can understand being part of the crowd that was watching these crucifixions, how you would you would be there and there would be an element of feeling like you need to psychologically cope with what you were seeing because of how horrific the crucifixion was. And so people would begin to mock and ridicule the people on the crosses for whatever various reasons why they were hanging on there. And Jesus was no different. And the, the crowd was mocking Jesus the entire time he was on the cross. And we can see that in verses 35 through 38 here. It says, And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. Again, there's the mockery, the, sarca the sarcasm in their voice. Uh, the soldiers also mocked him, coming, coming and offering him sour wine, something to, uh, you know, ease the pain, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And then verse 39 or 38 says, and an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew saying, this is the king of the Jews. And so the, the context of that is they used to put above the person's head who was on the cross, they used to put their crime. They used to say um, thief or, uh, you know, a murderer or whatever it may be. They would put that above their head so that people could look at them and say, oh, that's why he's being hung. This is what happens to a person who steals. This is what happens to a person who murders. And so for them to write that inscription above Jesus's head was just one more insult that they could throw at Jesus Christ by saying his crime is being the king of the Jews. There's a lot of different nuances there. And again, we don't have time to get into them, but the Romans were sticking it to the Jewish people. Uh, the Jewish people were mocking him for saying that he was the king of the Jews. And if you read back in the trials that Jesus went through, uh, the Jewish uh, Pharisees say, you know, we have no ruler but Caesar and all these things. And, and it's just, it's crazy how we got to this situation. And so they're mocking them. And, and even the criminals who are being crucified next to him, both of them took part in mocking him on the cross for being on the cross, for being the king of the Jews. And Matthew 27, 44 says, even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with, with the same thing, with the same mockery. Uh, Mark 15, verse 32 says essentially the same thing. These men were on the cross next to Jesus, suffering the same fate as him. But because of the crowd and their influence, and we'll talk about peer pressure, they couldn't resist but to mock him as well. Again, one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if, if you really who are who you say you are, save yourself and us. And that there's just insult there. But guys, before we believe and follow Jesus, before we come to life in Christ, 
oftentimes it, it's very easy to make fun of, it's very easy to mock, it's, it's very easy, easy to even become hostile towards not just Jesus, but his followers as well. And so we are all lost. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so we all think that that's our best coping mechanism. And sometimes it's interesting because if you're talking to a crowd of people, they might be mocking you for being a Christian. But if you get one of them off <laughs> on, on their own and start talking to them, it's interesting how a lot of times, I would say oftentimes, they will actually stop mocking you and actually start to just have a conversation and listen. They may not, they might, may not still appreciate what you're saying, but the, the making fun of kind of goes away when it's just one-on-one. -on -one. And it, a lot of times that's because they don't have the encouragement of the crowd around them to be laughing. But the whole world mocks Jesus, even though he is the very one that the whole world needs to save them. The criminals next to Jesus were influenced by popular opinion and just couldn't resist going with the flow. And that's no different than anything else. We all fall in and cave in to peer pressure at some point in our lives. So these criminals were no, no different. But here's the thing is Jesus' reaction was interesting because Jesus was humble in this moment. Because first off, what they were saying about him as far as being the king of the Jews and being able to save himself and all those kinds of things, they weren't wrong. He could have saved himself. He could have saved everyone there. He could have gotten down off of that cross and wiped out every enemy that he had in that moment and walked away unharmed. He didn't though because he was humbling himself to something greater. He was humbling himself to what God had called him to be and to do. And in all honesty, this isn't a surprise because in Jesus' life, we see him time after time, every single moment, being the perfect example of what humility truly means. And so we shouldn't be surprised that even in this moment, Jesus was humble. He didn't bite back. He didn't even defend himself. He knew what his purpose was, and he fulfilled it regardless of anyone else or what they said about him or about his father. Again, people were not just mocking Jesus in this moment. They were mocking God ultimately, because Jesus was sent by God to these people. And so it's also interesting to note that he did not cave in to the peer pressure. He did not get off the cross. He did not save himself in that moment because he had a bigger purpose. Again, guys, the reason for Jesus being on the cross was so that he could pay for the sins of the entire world, past, present, and future. He needed to be there for us. Otherwise, we needed a different mediator or we needed to go back to the sacrificial system, which just is imperfect and not great. And so Jesus knew that his purpose was bigger than just that immediate moment of the pain. And so how often when we get in a tight spot, when we get into a painful situation, when we get into a situation that's uncomfortable or makes us feel bad or whatever, we try and get out of that situation as fast as possible by any means necessary. Jesus did not do that in this case. He knew that he needed to go through this pain. Look, I don't dictate how God should do anything. Jesus dying on the cross was the ultimate case of a son obeying his father. And so we need to obey God as well, just the same way, because Jesus is our perfect example. The two men may have mocked, but one of them... Through getting to know Jesus and see Jesus and his actions and his words on the cross, he changed his tune a little bit. And that comes to our second point, which is the revelation of what happens here. It's fascinating to me that even on the cross, Jesus was reaching out to people <laughs> and changing their lives. He was able to do that even while on the cross. And, and it's not just the people that he actually talked to, but the people that were just around him witnessing what was happening. And, and this thief on the cross, look, something took place on the cross that convinced this man that he was being crucified next to a king and not a criminal. Verse 42 says, uh, then he said to Jesus, Lord, which implies uh, lordship, shocking. Uh, he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Interesting that he changed his tune from mocking Jesus to now saying, you are a king, you're my Lord, uh, and you have a kingdom that I want to be remembered in. Revelation about who Jesus is comes when we humble ourselves and realize who we are compared to who he is. 
verses 40 and 41 explain that revelation that he had. It says, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, meaning the criminal and him, the criminal that was mocking Jesus and the thief who was having the revelation about Jesus, they deserved to be there. They had actually committed crimes. And he was saying, we, we earned this. Jesus did not. And he says, this man did nothing wrong. So there's that revelation, that process of what happens here, and we see this. And if you turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16, really quickly, we're going we're gonna to read a little bit about Jesus. So uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 is where we're going to start. It may be a very familiar passage, but I think it's, it applies here to what's going on. And, and it says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, He asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's so fascinating. You know what? I'm going to finish that. I'm going to finish that little interaction between Jesus and Peter really quick because it's it's a big point here. It says Jesus answered and said to him, "Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven." The revelation comes from God. I know that we think that we are big deals, <laughs> but we're not. We we don't we don't come to God per se. He comes to us. He, he comes down to our level, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. He comes down to our level, and he gives us revelation about who he is. And so we need his help. And so whatever was happening on this cross, this, this thief realized who Jesus was compared to who he was. And so it begs the question that all of us have to answer and all of us have to ask, who do you say Jesus is? Who is Jesus to you? Because if he's just a a prophet, if he's just a good person, if he's just a guy who lived his life and whatever, then then his death on a cross meant nothing. If he says who he is, who he says he is, then his death on the cross does everything. And so who do you say Jesus is, is probably one of the most important questions that any of us will ever answer in our entire life. And we see the thief on a cross answering that question in this moment. He realizes who Jesus is. He is the King. He is Lord. He is over all. And he's the Son of God. So it's an amazing revelation that takes place. And the truth is, is we don't know exactly what happened in the thief's heart, but it could have just been watching an innocent man die in a horrific way was enough to move this man to emotion, to actually change. It could have been a conversation that's not recorded in our Bible that Jesus actually had with this thief on the cross. Whatever it was, it happened. And this man went from mocking Jesus to asking to remember his name in his kingdoms kingdom, sorry. Look, there are many stories of men and women who set out to disprove God or to prove that God doesn't exist. Um, And a large, a shockingly large number of those people end up writing books or articles on how it's impossible God doesn't exist. They change their mind. And and some of the examples are uh, the Case for Christ guy, uh, Lee Strobel is his name. Um, There was a scientist, and I I can't remember his name, and I didn't write it in my notes, uh, but there was a scientist that actually wrote a book that was uh, 99 Reasons Why God Doesn't Exist. And he was writing a second book uh, called 100 Reasons Why or 101 Reasons Why God Doesn't Exist. And through that process, through studying, through archaeology and through science and through all these other things, he actually ended up coming to the Lord. Uh, which is not uncommon. And he ended up writing a book called 100 and Reasons, 101 Reasons Why I Was Wrong, <laughs> which is awesome because the guy was able to humble himself in that moment and admit his fault, which doesn't happen often, at least not as often as we would like to see. Um, but guys, we have to come to the point where we understand who Jesus Christ is. 
When we do that, it changes everything about our perspective. We go from mocking him to saying, hmm, maybe he's got a point here, to saying, holy cow, you are Lord of all. Everything about you makes me want to worship you. And so Jesus is always more concerned with our spiritual health over anything else in our lives. Because at that point, when, when this guy said, you know, Lord, remember me in your kingdom, Jesus could have snapped his fingers and that guy be off the cross and or in heaven in that moment or whatever. But he was more concerned about this guy's spiritual health, this spiritual well-being. And that's true for us today. Yes, we have physical needs, and yes, we have material needs, and yes, we have even emotional needs and spiritual needs and all of these things. God is so concerned with your standing in salvation that everything else becomes an afterthought. If you are not saved, if you are not a follower of Jesus, that is his primary concern. So just understand, sometimes it can be frustrating because we think God isn't listening to us when we're praying for for health or we're praying for our family or friends or all these other things. Just remember, God is more concerned with the spiritual over anything else in our lives. The thief on the cross, once he realized who Jesus was, had an understanding that his physical situation was not going to get any better. But his soul or his spiritual situation still had time. Look, the other thief was very concerned with, get us off of this cross, save ourselves, like save our skins. We need your help. Save me, save me, save me. And we hear that again all the time. The, the other thief, the thief who had the revelation, was saying, I get it. <laughs> I, I deserve this. I am going to die. But my spiritual, my afterlife, my, my future is still in God's hands. And so remember me. It is a wonderful thing to come to the place where you understand the need we all have for a Savior and to no longer look at God as an almighty slot machine waiting to give us a physical payday, but as the one way that we can find forgiveness and fulfillment and peace. And that leads us to our third and final point, the rest that comes with Jesus and with this revelation. This is the moment that defines a person. What is he going to say? I just opened up. I admitted my fault. I admitted my guilt. And I need Jesus to save me. Will he be gracious to me? Or will he turn, turn me away? Guys, this is a very legitimate, concerning question that a lot of people have. Because humbling yourself, A, isn't fun. It's not easy. It's embarrassing. It's hard. And if you humble yourself and God rejects you, that hurts double. And so that's a very legitimate question. And I want to answer that question right now with what the Bible says very literally and very authoritatively so that you can have peace in your heart knowing that you are not going to be turned away. 1 John 1 9 says this, if we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness all. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't even matter what you're going to do. He is faithful to cleanse us of all unrighteousness if we confess our sins to him. And so there is no maybe here. There is no like, well, try it and see. No, th there, there are no ca caveats to this, to this plan. It's plain and simple. Confess, be forgiven. That's it. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And when that happens, when we go to God, we experience the rest of God. We experience what it means to have complete fulfillment and contentment and peace. Because he has us in his hands. He's got the whole world. Yeah, that song definitely makes sense in this context. We can enjoy the rest of God. Jesus gave the thief, one of the most significant, important things anyone could ask for. And that is the promise of a life in paradise after death, an eternal life in paradise with him after, day, after death. Jesus said these words, and it is amazing, and it's encouraging, and it's beautiful. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Today. The thief had asked to be remembered at some point in the future. 
He had asked to be remembered in God's kingdom, just remembered. Jesus gave him a better promise to actually be with him in paradise. And this word paradise is interesting. In the Greek, it means the king's garden. It's the idea of this special place for special guests to go with the king to spend personal time with him in his garden, strolling, talking, very relaxed atmosphere, um, not any kind of, there were no formalities here. It was paradise. It was you were able to be yourself and the king was being himself. And Jesus was inviting the thief to a personal eternity with him in his garden and God and the Holy Spirit and, and millions of other believers. But, but there's that personal aspect of walking through the garden with, with Jesus Christ. And there's an old hymn called In the Garden. And it goes, Andy walks with me, Andy talks with me. And that's actually why I'm named Andrew, by the way, is because my mom, when she was a little girl, went to church with my great-grandmother, I believe it was, and they used to sing that song. And my great-grandmother would lean over to my mother and say, who's Andy? And so I was going to be Andy no matter what. And so there you go. There's a little backstory for you. But guys, we have this idea of a personal, intimate time with the Father, with, with Jesus as well. And just the thought of an eternity with Jesus in a garden gives the feeling of, a, uh, of rest and relaxation. At least it does to me. Just peaceful, calm. <sighs> because this life can get rough sometimes. And so knowing that I don't have to worry about my afterlife, I don't have to worry about death. Death now becomes something that is exciting, not something that's dreadful. Guys, it gives you peace. And this is not, this is important. This is not an earn it statement that, that Jesus is giving. It's an immediate thing. Today, you're going to be with me. Why? Because you confessed and you believed. That's it. It's an immediate thing. Today. Today. And here's the thing, guys. This is a deathbed salvation. <laughs> This is, look, there, there's a good quote. I don't know who it was by, but it was a quote that says, there is one deathbed conversion in the Bible. And it's so that no one would despair, but only one so that no one would presume. And I love that. We do have a biblical mandate for a last minute, last second salvation. This is the example right here. This thief was done and gone, but he was saved. And, as, through, as though by fire, he was plucked out of, the, out of the flames of hell. But guys, that is not the norm. That is not what we hope for. We don't hope for the procrastination. We want to get it done now because the Bible also says no man is guaranteed tomorrow. God's grace extends to the worst of the worst. And yes, that even includes the procrastinators. But the risk, the, that risk is not one that's worth it. So guys, in this moment, today, you can have that eternal salvation. Today, you can have that promise that you will be, regardless of if your life lasts 10 more minutes or 100 more years, you can have that promise that you will be with God, you will be with Jesus in his garden in paradise. Look, God doesn't meet us halfway and carry us from there. He stoops down to our level and meets us where we are and he holds us for the rest of our life, however long that is. He holds us close. There is no earning this. There is no working for it. There is no anything. It is just confess, believe, be saved. It is an amazing process that so many people reject because, well, there's a lot of different reasons to reject it. Um, stubbornness is one. Um, ignorance is another. There, there's, there's many different reasons. And so what I would encourage you guys to do is look at how you can walk down this path knowing that you are saved. Today you will be with me in paradise. There is no baptism that had to happen. There is no tithes that had to be counted. There is no um, <laughs> forgiveness that had to be given from anyone other than Jesus Christ. It was today you will be with me in paradise. Now, if you have an opportunity to do all of those things, yes, do them. Get baptized. You should be tithing. You should be definitely going to people and asking for forgiveness for wrongs that you have done. But that is not a caveat to being able to be saved. So here, here what, here's what I'm going to cl close with. It's a couple of questions. Where are you at? 
Are you ridiculing God? Are you coming to a new revelation of who he is compared to who you are? Or have you entered into that victorious relationship of rest in him? Wherever you are, know that he is with you. He wants to give you the rest and peace of being with him in paradise, an eternal paradise where you spend time with him. He desires us to be there with him, so much so that he gave his life on the cross to do it, to make it possible, because outside of that, guys, there is no sacrifice that can fulfill that for us. It cannot fulfill the, the payment that it takes for us to get into heaven. All you have to do is confess your sins, believe on him, and follow. There's no requirement of perfection. There's no requirement of, again, alms or tithes or anything like that. It's, it's just Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, paying for your sins, paying for your debt. To tell us die is the word that he utters. It is finished. It is done. And all you have to do is just take one step closer and trust him a little bit more. Regardless of where you're at in those three questions, whether you're ridiculing the Lord, whether you're having the revelation about the Lord, or whether you're resting in the Lord, we need to take one step closer and trust him a little bit more and be encouraged that no matter what, today, in this moment, we can be saved and we will be in paradise with him. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that your word is just amazing. And not just your word, but like your actions, God, are beyond comprehension. We thank you that you love us so much that you were willing to die on the cross for us. We thank you that you have provided a way for, for us to, to enjoy paradise with you, to enjoy being in the garden with you. Lord, I ask for these people who are listening right now, I pray that they would be convicted for that person who is wrestling with mocking you, mocking me, mocking whatever, Lord, I pray that you would just touch their heart and soften them to what you are trying to say right now. They're not too far gone. And in this moment alone, they can pray to you and they can say, Lord, I am a sinner. I want to be saved and I want to follow you. Lord, that's it. I just pray that even in this moment, you would do that, that you would put that on their hearts. Lord, we thank you. And for those of us who have chosen to follow you, I pray that you would encourage us to understand that we have hope regardless of how rough this world gets, regardless of how against us it may feel. Lord, we have hope for the future. So Lord, we thank you. We love you. We pray that you would go with us this week and help us to be better examples of, of who you are compared to who we, we are. We love you and we thank you in your name. Amen. Thank you for joining us for church today. We're so glad that you decided to spend the time with us uh, worshiping, learning, and growing together. We'd love to stay connected with you throughout the week. And a few simple ways to do that is like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram. Now, if none of those sound appealing to you or you're just not really into the whole social thing, don't worry. Uh, you can check us out on our website and we have a news page there as well. And we provide all the information about what's coming up here at Pathway. So we'd love for you to check that out. And that's at pathwaycc.net slash news. All right. I think that's everything. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your week.